Hi, today at lawcaseuk.com I'm going to be looking at the judicial review conducted by the House of Lords in the 1985 case of Council of Civil Service Unions and the Minister of the Civil Service, a case more commonly known as the GCHQ case. Now this is a case that most often crops up in the second half of a public law course here at Surrey we look at it in Public Law 2, which comes up in the second year. If you're on a course entitled Constitutional and Administrative Law, then it will probably come up in the second half of that course, that which deals with administrative law. And this is because it's fundamentally a judicial review case, and judicial review lies at the heart of administrative law. Now, it might, might help at this stage if I say something about what judicial review actually is and in this respect we have some assistance from the judgment in the GCHQ case particularly that given by Lord Diplock because here he says that judicial review is the means by which judicial control of administrative action is exercised. So it is the judiciary reviewing the decision of someone who is exercising a public function. Within the constitutional ar architecture, we might say that it's the judiciary providing a check upon executive action. Now, hopefully that provides some legal background, but in terms of the case itself, it's interesting for us for a number of reasons, I would suggest. Firstly, and this is a key part of the ratio of the case, it identifies that the royal prerogative is capable of being judicially reviewed. Secondly, it shows how the courts will, in certain circumstances, defer to the authority of the executive, for example, in national security type cases. Um, but in this regard, the 1985 GCHQ case is not determinative, um, and whilst it is an important stepping stone in the process, you should also have regard to later cases on this aspect. The final reason why this case is useful, particularly for students, is that it provides a reference point for identifying the grounds of judicial review and offering some definitions of them. So that's quite useful for us as students. Now, turning to the case itself, of course, we need to begin with the facts. And um, if you look at the judgment, the facts are best dealt with in the judgment written by Lord Fraser. Now. GCHQ is in fact the government's communications headquarters and it has two functions. Firstly, to ensure the security of official information, i.e. prevent us being spied upon. And then it has this other function of providing signals and intelligence to the government and that's its spying function, if you like. Um, it's one of the three intelligence services alongside the security service, MI5, and the secret intelligence service, MI6. Now, the GCHQ was established in 1947, and for a long time, its staff had been members of a trade union, been permitted to be members of a trade union, and as part of their membership of trade union, a practice had developed that the employer, GCHQ, the government, would consult the trade unions before it made any major changes to the terms and conditions of employment. Now here's the reason why the case comes about at all, because in 1984 the government of the day announced that it was immediately introducing new conditions of employment and these prohibited trade union membership. The government claimed that it was doing so in response to a number of incidents of industrial action that industri industrial action, the government claimed, had affected the ability of GCHQ to do its job and accordingly had prejudiced national security, given the role that GCHQ had. It also claimed that it couldn't follow the established practice of consultation because to do so would have um, encouraged more industrial action and further prejudice to the work of GCHQ and thereby national security. Now, importantly for our understanding of the case, the government had no statutory power to change the terms and conditions of employment. It could only find that power within the royal prerogative. And I've written 
elsewhere on this website a short blog that explains the royal prerogative. But in a nutshell, of course, in the majority of cases, the government can only do what the law entitles it to do, and it needs to find authority for that in either statute or prerogative power. So in this case, it arose from the prerogative. And whilst the courts took a little time to establish that, once it was established, um, it was proceeded on the basis this was uh, a power that emanated from the prerogative. So the first issue becomes, therefore, whether that prerogative can be judicially reviewed. Now, I'm going to base the majority of my analysis from here on in on the judgment of Lord Diplock. It's a comprehensive judgment. It's relatively easily to follow. Most of the judges in the case are of um, similar opinions, and indeed some of them express uh, make expressions of support for Lord Diplock's judgment. For, so for those reasons, that's where I'm going to concentrate. Um, so on this first issue, whether the prerogative was capable of judicial review at all, he was pretty succinct. Um, he said that he saw no reason why a power should be immune from judicial review just because it was a prerogative emanating from common law um, rather than a power emanating from statute. He felt that if the decision was capable of being reviewed given that it had come from statute, then it should be capable of being reviewed similarly because it came from prerogative and it should make no difference the source of the power. The second issue that then had to ask himself was Prima facie, do the employees have a ground of review? And this is where he begins by outlining the grounds of review that exist under judicial review. Um, and he also gives them convenient labels. And Lord Roskill, in his accompanying judgment, refers to Diplock here as um, devising a new nomenclature for judicial review. And this is useful to us because... Here is Lord Diplock setting out these grounds, going on to define them for us. And this can provide good material for the beginning of um, judicial review analysis, um, judicial review essays, etc. Now, this is what he said, it's quite a long quote. Judicial review has, I think, developed to a stage today when, without reiterating any analysis of the steps by which the development has come about, one can conveniently classify under three heads, the grounds upon which administrative action is subject to control by judicial review. The first I would call illegality, the second irrationality, and the third procedural impropriety. That is not to say that further development on a case-by-case -case basis may not, in course of time, add further grounds. I have in mind particularly the possible adoption in the future of the principle of proportionality, which is recognised in the administrative law of several of our fellow members of the European Economic Community. Now, I've kept the second half of that quote in there because I think his mention of proportionality here is interesting. He's looking into the future. And since he said that, of course, we now have the Human Rights Act. And this has meant that proportionality is indeed a ground within Human Rights Act review, um, within human rights cases. But now there's a debate as to whether proportionality should also be included within non-Human Rights Act review as a ground in its own right, adding to the three grounds that he identified there to make four grounds uh, um, within um, traditional judicial review or indeed replacing something like um, irrationality with proportionality. Now, again, Lord Diplock's crystal ball gazing here provides us with a useful reference point if we are conducting any analysis that um, is asking this question as to whether it should be included or whether it should be a replacement for one of the existing grounds of review. So that's a digression, but I hope it's a useful one. So we go back to the case Lord Diplock then goes on to review the government decision using the third ground of judicial review that he identified, that of procedural impropriety. Now, there are a number of aspects within this ground, but one of which is the, a notion of legitimate expectation. And put simply, this means that because 
of the way that a public authority has acted in the past and or because of what it has said, it can create an expectation that it will continue to act in the same way in the future. And if it does that, then someone affected by a change in the, the behaviour of the public authority can claim a cause of action against that authority, in effect to force it to comply with the expectation that that individual had. Now, it's important to note here that the expectation does not arise from any other particular legal right. It's a standalone um, right that exists in public law and is independent of, of any private right. And so, for example, if we look at the GCHQ case, because of the historical relationship between the Crown and civil servants, there is no contract of employment in 1985 that would, would enable the employees to sue in private law in order to enforce their em employment rights. Of course, had this been a private company, the situation would be different. But because there is no private law right for the employees at judicial review, sorry, private right for them to sue upon, the only available option for them becomes this public law um, judicial review ground procedural propriety, which includes this notion of legitimate expectation. So Lord Diplock takes a look at that and he decides that when he applies that to the facts of the case, that the employees of GCHQ did, prima facie at least, have a legitimate expectation that they would continue to enjoy the benefits of trade union membership and also that as one of those benefits there would be an expectation that the union and the employees would follow this established consultation process, um, which didn't happen in this case. And in particular, what Lord Diplock says, he says that prima facie, the employees were entitled as a matter of public law under the head of procedural impropriety before administrative action was taken on a decision to withdraw the employment benefit to have communicated to the national trade unions by which they had theretofore been represented the reason for such withdrawal and for such unions to be given an opportunity to comment on it. So he decided that in law they had a legitimate expectation um, and factually the evidence supported that. He then looked at the reason why this expectation was not met and the reason put forward by the government here was of course that of national security. And on this, this is important, Diplock said this, he said, national security is the responsibility of executive government. Common sense dictates that this is a matter upon which those upon whom the responsibility rests and not the courts of justice must have the last word. It is par excellence a non-justiciable question. The judicial process is totally inept to deal with the sort of problems which it involves. So in 1985, this means that while the judiciary can review executive government and can review its use of prerogative powers, there are some subject areas such as national security that are beyond full judicial examination and in effect the judiciary have stepped back from conducting this full review. Lord Ruskell, in his judgment, he provides a useful list of non-reviewable prerogative powers. But bear in mind that whilst he's correct in 1985, you can only be sure that he is correct at that date because later cases have come to look at this issue as well. Now, from the quote that I've just read from Lord Diplock, we can see two reasons from the, for this stepping back. Constitutionally, Lord Diplock identifies that national security is not the judiciary's job, it's the responsibility of the executive. So constitutionally, he identifies that. The second thing I he identifies is really an expertise issue. He says that the judicial process is inept to deal with this. He's saying that the judiciary lack the expertise. Only the executive has this expertise. And as he says, only the executive has access to the sources of information necessary to judge the concept of national security. Now, this stepping back 
from full judicial review is often termed as deference, although there you will see some opposition to this description in some of the case law. But I find this aspect of the case particularly interesting, but I must re-emphasise that if this is what you're looking at, you have to consider the, the later case law. Now, in terms of summarising the GCHQ case, it didn't say, of course, that civil servants could not have review. Indeed, it identifies that they can, and that they can even if the government is acting under prerogative powers. It also identifies that they are capable of holding a legitimate expectation and can seek judicial review on the ground of procedural impropriety. However, what the case does say is that once executive government justifies its, ac its action on the basis of national security, the court in 1985 will not interfere with this. But as I say, there are later cases to consider on the point, and perhaps I should give you an example. So if you look at the case of A and others against the Secretary of State for the Home Department in 2004, um, that's a key case to look at in this respect. And it's a case that um, postdates the Human Rights Act. So you, you see a lot of human rights aspects being um, looked at in that case. Um, the case is often known as the Balmarsh case or the Balmarsh 9. But I should say that um, you should take care not to confuse it with the case of this, the same name that occurs one year later in 2005, because that case is um, about the use of evidence obtained via torture. And that's a different case. Interesting, but different. Now, I hope to analyse the 2004 Balmars case, at least, at some time in the future on this website. So if it interests you, look out for it here. But that's GCHQ. Um, as a final postscript to the GCHQ case, I can say that the, the ban on trade union membership continued for 13 years after the initial government decision, but it no longer exists, as it was overturned by the incoming Labour government when it took power in 1997. So, as at today, the employees of GCHQ do enjoy the benefits of trade union membership.